All right. Um, hi, welcome everyone. Um, so um, I'll get us started. I wanted to first, um, as part of the land acknowledgement, I know that the uh, conference has been earmarking funds for the Alma Medicine and Land uh, Trust, um, which is wonderful. I also live in Santa Cruz County. I live in Boulder Creek. Um, and I just kind of wanted to highlight uh, the work that this group does in particular um, uh, as a, 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 a person who was, um, whose neighborhood was uh, affected by the CZU fire um, in 2020, about a third of my neighborhood burned down. Um, and the work that they're doing in part um, isn't just um, in order to kind of um, help and support that tribe, but also um, help, help support the land um, and the work that they're doing to restore the land um, and prevent things like the CZU fire from happening in the future. And so um, if you haven't already supported this organization, I highly recommend it. Um, it's one that I support monthly and um, they uh, also have, if you're a gardener, um, they also have these regular um, uh, uh, working the land sessions. I haven't been able to go yet because I have a three-year-old um, I can't take with me. He's not old enough yet. Um, but if that's not a problem you have in your local, um, I highly recommend um, supporting this group. All right. Um, so with that, let's get started. Um, so I'm going to start off our panel today. Um, my panel or my portion of the panel is split into two parts. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Ban and Mission Integration Grant project that we're all a part of, and it helped um, inform our presentations today. Um, and then I'll talk about my own approach to generative AI in the classroom, um, which will kind of function as a segue into the wonderful work that my colleagues um, will be teasing out um, for the rest of this presentation. Um, so first, the Bannon Mission Integration Grant. Um, in December 2021, um, an interdisciplinary group of faculty and staff from the English department, the School of Engineering and the library were awarded the Bannon Mission Integration Grant, um, which is awarded by the Santa Clara University Ignatian Center to support deeper integration of the mission and tradition of Santa Clara University into their teaching, research or programs. Our project focuses on revising the engineering communications course, which is an upper division class focusing on professional and research writing uh, that all engineering majors at Santa Clara University must take. Um, and to meet the grant's requirement of integrating the mission and tradition of Santa Clara into teaching, um, we centered a lot of our effort, efforts on developing more course content uh, to meet the new DEI goals developed both within the English department and the School of Engineering since 2020. Um, other parts of our project included addressing gaps in information literacy instruction um, and ironing out overlaps with other School of Engineering courses. Um, we've actually accomplished quite a lot with this project um, in the past almost two years that we've been working on it. Um, so we've completed a course assessment um, and now the School of Engineering is undergoing a curriculum revision and so we're waiting for their response. Um, to that and some suggestions that we've made as far as things like core requirements. Um, so those requirements that our student has to take and how they're affiliated with this class. Um, we've developed additional information literary sessions on um, part of which Andrew's gonna be talking about today, but they include things like topic, topic development, um, gray literature, patent searching, ethics and social justice resources and so on. Um, we've hosted DEI focused programs, um, such as the Women in Engineering STEM Dinner, um, as well as several guest speakers um, uh, that have been kind of coordinated through this grant. Um, we've brought more attention to DEI and social justice issues within the class itself. Um, so just adjusting and adding to our lesson plans and our assignments, um, some of those uh, um, kind of considerations as students work on their research projects. Um, and we've recently imp implemented methods for addressing the increased use of generative AI. Um, and so with the rise of things like ChatGPT um, that didn't exist really when we developed this project in 2021, um, we felt that it was important to think about how we can prepare our engineering students as they encounter it, not only as a tool for doing assignments, um, but also in the workforce where generative AI um, we're using generative AI is likely to be a necessary skill set um, as it becomes more and more common um, out in the professional world. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with the way that I've sort of dipped my toe in the water um, uh, with using generative AI. Um, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues um, who have some excellent approaches that are applicable beyond just the engineering communications classroom or technical writing classroom, 
um, that you can probably apply to yours as well with just a little bit of fudging around. All right, so here's what I do. Um, um, I have for many years, um, uh, probably like six or seven years now, I've had my engineering writing students um, begin each quarter um, by developing their own style guide or their own writing standards um, that their assignments are measured against. Um, and so rather than it being me who kind of uh, articulates, okay, here are, here's what I'm looking for, we kind of collectively as a group decide what we are looking for to create professional documents. Um, and so this guide includes, it originally included four categories, now includes five. Um, it includes audience, um, which includes cultural considerations with respect, with respect to audience, um, writing considerations. Um, so these are things like kind of like how you construct and how you organize your document. Um, uh, generative AI is sort of the new category um, uh, and layout. I realize now that there are four categories. I clearly can't count right after I turn it in grades. Um, it's a three class process to draft um, these writing standards. Um, so what we do is we begin each of the first three classes um, basically by defining one or two of the categories. Um, and then I give like about 20 to 30 minutes of time for the students to just kind of collectively work on a Google Doc um, and develop the guidelines that they want to go by. And so part of that like kind of finding of these two categories um, includes some suggestions for standards. Um, so they're not really going in totally blind. They can kind of choose and pull from um, what I've put together, uh, just having done this over the years, things that I think students could gravitate to and are useful for them. Um, and, you know, things that I hope that they'll put in and pick out, of course, um, and they usually do. Uh, so, so they kind of work from that like list and of suggestions and articulate it in their sort of own words. Um, and then after we do this over the course of about like, a week, um, I will polish whatever they draft. Um, so kind of get rid of redundancies, make it sort of like a complete document. Um, I send it out to the students and then in class and whatever the next class is, we'll vote to accept those um, as our style guide um, for the assignments that they'll be doing that quarter. And so in addition to meeting whatever requirements like content wise that those assignments um, have, um, I also judge them against the style guide. Are you meeting the style guide requirements? And it's really funny because they're often very good at um, meeting the content requirements and I never have to like kind of ask them to revise and resubmit because um, I don't like grade. I do the, um, I mark things complete or incomplete labor-based grading and sort of, I have them revise and redo things. And I always frame that in the like, in the professional world, you're not gonna turn things in and be like, oh, well, maybe next time you're gonna have to actually fix them. Um, uh, so that's what they have to do in this. Um, and so they, they're great at meeting the content requirements, um, but it's often just they forget about these writing standards that they've already developed themselves, which is sort of funny, but um, it makes it easier for them to kind of like have this checklist to go back and reflect on and, um, and make sure that they're using. Um, and so what I'll show over the next couple slides now are the results of that um, for my two sections this past quarter, what they came up with as far as the requirements and the style guide requirements um, for generative AI. Um, and so this is my first class. Um, and again, I gave them some example um, statements and uh, uh, other policies um, and other classes that they can sort of pull from. So some of this language does come from that. Um, but so ChatGPT and other generative AI cannot help you pass the course on its own. Um, accuracy, you need to fact check the content generative AI creates with research of your own. You need to credit the use of AI when generating text, keep track of exactly how you use ChatGPT or other AIs, um, review the content produced by AI to eliminate biases, um, be aware of cultural faux pas when relying on generative AI, be aware that OpenAI collects all conversations between users in ChatGPT, so you don't want to pass in company intellectual property or other confidential, uh, confidential info into their database. AI content may be limited in its creativity and originality. And then from the second section, it's very similar. Um, provide attribution for use of AI, um, provide the prompt that you use, let your reader know that you're drawing on AI. Uh, only use AI when it's relevant for the audience and paper. Make sure you generate your own prompts, limit its involvement to generating actual content, such as thesis statements, body paragraphs, et cetera. Focus on using it for structure or templates that you can fill in but what AI generates in your own words and in a formatting style that meets your audience's needs and the document's purpose. 
review what AI generates to eliminate biases. And remember, AI cannot adjust accurately for different audiences or cultures and fact check what the AI generates. Um, so just a couple of things I wanted to sort of highlight um, from what the students put together here um, is their concerns about bias kind of came through, I think, in both classes, um, especially with respect to other cultures. They're thinking, I have them thinking sort of like a company mindset, like if you are part of a company and representing that company, um, uh, we need to sort of be considerate of all these different things. And so they were kind of aware of how those can affect our relations as like a representative of this company. Um, uh, they were thinking about audience, um, who they're targeting, um, and how ChatGPT and such AI aren't really uh, 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 easy to use to sort of think about audience in that way. Um, they were both uh, interested in citing their use of AI, um, and um, I really wanted to especially highlight one I hadn't really even thought of at all, um, uh, is that uh, confidentiality, um, which I wasn't aware of <laughs> as being an issue, um, but they were, and so they added it here into, into their um, standards. And I thought that was something that we don't often think about, and so they were able to sort of add that into the conversation. Um, but so I found this all very interesting. And again, I'm just dipping my toe into sort of thinking about these things and it worked really well with the writing standards throughout the quarter. Um, so students, they, they didn't use uh, as far as I, unless they forgot to cite it, um, they didn't use generative AI really very often at all, um, but they did cite it um, that they did mention when they used it, they um, uh, let me know and they talked to me about it and, and even had some conversations about like, hey, I tried to do this and it didn't work. Um, and suggestions of how to go back and work with it. So um, it gave them sort of opportunity to familiarize their self, themselves with generative AI and use it as a tool um, because I opened that door, but they sort of set specific standards um, to make sure that they weren't um, kind of going too far, I guess, or, or getting into trouble with it. Um, but with that, I will pass on um, to our next group on the Panel. Um, so yeah, I think it's Mara and Teresa, so I'll hand it off to you. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. Um, and if you wouldn't mind um, advancing the slide. All right, so um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to be presenting with my colleague, um, Teresa Conifrey, and um, our portion of the presentation is on applying social justice and inclusive design frameworks in our engineering communications class. Um, we're gonna be discussing um, some features of inclusive design, um, how we use a specific framework to um, introduce social justice in, into the communication and design process. And we're also going to talk about how we apply some of these strategies um, to develop critical approaches um, for chat GPT, um, for students to work with chat GPT. Uh, next slide, please. And so some of the questions that um, we're interested in are, you know, how do we um, encourage students to think about creating content as well as products um, because we are teaching engineering students for diverse users? And also how can social justice frameworks help us to develop critical approaches um, for examining issues of bias and the advantages and limitations of generative AI tools? Um, next slide, please. Um, so I want to get a little bit of background. Um, shortly after I started teaching technical um, and professional communication for engineering students, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 6. And suddenly his ability to do things like go to school or do after school activities depended in large part on my ability to compose and design multimedia texts that make knowledge accessible to non-specialists. Access to things like going to camp um, often involves developing training and instruction documents, and at times calling out problems of bias and summarizing legal documents around reasonable accommodations, things that I've had to do just this week. Um, so as a parent of a child with a chronic illness, my work with technical communication is really inseparable from the work of disability allyship and activism. And these lived experiences really shape the way that I teach and also how I ask students to think critically about the needs and experiences of diverse audiences and users, as well as whose interests and perspectives um, have been privileged or overlooked in communication 
problem definition and design processes. And so, you know, I, I sometimes share this as an example, just as a kind of snapshot from some of the documents that I developed for my son. And I say, look, see, even I'm labeling my figures. I am numbering and labeling my figures. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, in my class, we talk about um, how the communication landscape in tech um, tends to privilege whiteness among um, many other things. And one example that I give is um, the use of master and slave to talk about database architecture, um, basically where one device or process controls another. Um, we read a firsthand account by Ryan Perry about what it was like as a black software engineer to have to constantly address requests to the master, ask permission for the master, and basically how it made him and others really question belonging in the field. Because I've had students that say, you know, these are just terms, they don't really have an impact. And then so I think, you know, having them engage with these different perspectives helps them to understand that um, you know, when you are dealing with a problem at 3 a.m. and you have to ask permission for the master, that can make you kind of question um, where you belong in, in this particular field. Um, in 2020, fortunately, GitHub finally announced that master would be replaced uh, with main. Um, but these are some of the, you know, examples that I highlight um, one of the um, members of our group also hosts a walking the walk series um, with that features um, students from underrepresented and minoritized uh, groups um, in STEM and, you know, kind of sharing some of their perspectives. And I'm able to sort of utilize and draw on some of those videos in the classroom to kind of highlight the, these perspectives and the importance of thinking about um, inclusive language practices. Um, I also have students uh, work with a range of, of resources, and I'll, I'll put one of them um, in the chat. This is a uh, diversity style guide. Um, also, Google has a, an inclusive documentation guide um, that points out um, strategies for, you know, identifying and addressing ableist language, unnecessarily gendered language like manpower, you know, or, you know, man hours or things like that. Um, also, you know, language that is, you know, inherently racist, like the master um, slave example. And I asked, you know, in, in connection um, with what my colleague Jackie was talking about, I asked students to kind of develop a style sheet in which they can kind of summarize and synthesize the principles of inclusive documentation, having students kind of develop these style sheets and kind of take ownership of them, you know, I think makes them um, more sophisticated and thoughtful about their own language practices. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so I think some of this work has also really inspired me to develop teaching and learning activities um, to think about inclusion in connection, you know, with other topics, um, specifically engineering, design, and aesthetics. Um, when we talk about aesthetics in engineering design, one of the things we really highlight is the idea that form follows function. And this is really a principle from architecture that uh, how something looks tells you something about how you are going to use it, that no details are um, extraneous. And um, when we think about um, diversity and inclusion, this can actually, I think, really help us to think about engineering aesthetics in really important ways. Um, you know, we ask students to work in groups to identify an example of good design and to make a case for its effectiveness in terms of aesthetics and inclusivity. Um, you know, how are these designs working, you know, to address the needs of diverse users? How are they, you know, empowering users, enabling them to do things that they might not have been able to do before? We also ask students to identify limitations with designs um, as all products and designs have limitations and to think about the possibilities for improvement. Um, specifically, we also ask them to think about opportunities where um, thinking about um, diverse users needs, um, inclusivity um, can actually lead to better tech um, and more innovative tech. Um, next slide, please. 
And one of the examples that I, I use is something that, you know, is, is a common technology in, in our home. This is an insertion device for a Dexcom G6 um, continuous glucose monitor that enables um, individuals with type 1 diabetes um, to monitor their blood glucose levels. Um, and this is actually a kind of really great device because prior devices were incredibly complex. You had to assemble them. Um, they involved huge needles, multi-step processes, 15-minute videos. And what's great about this is that, you know, in addition to no assembly, um, form follows function. You have this color contrast that draws attention to what you need to press in order to operate. And I mentioned, you know, the importance of thinking about diverse users because most people are diagnosed with type one diabetes when they are young. And there are these videos on YouTube of young kids doing their own insertion. And it can be really empowering to be able to do this yourself. You can turn to the next slide. Um, and, you know, this is, these are the videos. Um, and, uh, but there are limitations to this. Um, you know, it is a medical device um, with a needle, and needles should be put in in sharp containers. And when I when I actually bring this device into the class and show that it doesn't fit in your standard sharps container, um, and that disposing of this actually creates both um, environmental issues as well as safety issues because there's no safe way to remove the needle and there's no safe way really to dispose of it. So we talk about what it would mean to develop, you know, more sustainable solutions around this. So having students really work with existing products on the market and then do this process of evaluation um, where they are thinking about sustainability, um, they are thinking about inclusivity, diverse users, um, but also opportunities for improvement. And, you know, one of the things that I like to ask them um, is a question from um, Donnie Johnson Saki, a professor of Black technical communication. Um, will the design enable others to pursue goals beyond what the designer intends? Um, to kind of think about their work in a much more expansive way and to apply these kinds of critical approaches to help them understand that inclusivity and social justice are not mere add-ons to the design process, but must be thought about really um, when they are generating questions, um, when they are you know, thinking about the problem definition phase. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in the next step of our, our presentation, my colleague is going to talk about a seven-step framework um, that we use um, specifically to help students think through the stages of this process and how we can design uh, for social justice. Hello, everyone. Can we switch to the next slide, please? So you'll see that this slide is the same one that we had before, but it's uh, about social justice and design in relation to artificial intelligence. But first of all, I'd like to say, hello, everyone. How are you doing? I teach technical writing, but I also teach people. And I think that that is what we have to keep in mind, that those teachers, instructors who think they might be replaced, that depends. Good teaching is good teaching, and students want a connection. So for me, what's important in this class um, in the age of AI is establishing a respectful classroom community. If we want students to feel safe playing with new technologies, experimenting, then they have to feel safe with each other. So that's always um, very important to me. So in this framework then, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna focus on a few parts, uh, listening, reducing imposed harms and risks, and enhancing human capabilities. Next slide, please. In the context of listening, you, as you could imagine, listening is similar whether it's designing a new product or whether it's thinking about AI. We need to be very aware of who our users are, what their context is, make sure that we understand any constraints in a design situation or uh, using AI. So in that, uh, in that vein, I've been doing a lot of user testing with my students. We've had assignments, for example, where we looked at the EULA. Students were quite surprised to see that, that they are, um, could be liable for any issues if they accidentally share copyright information. 
and so on if they share inaccurate information that if there are any consequences with using some of these AI technologies, they in fact would have to support the technology, support the companies rather than defend themselves. So that's kind of interesting to them. And then of course, there are all the privacy issues. And then um, as Jackie mentioned, we come up together with a list of how we might use AI in class, what ethical considerations we might have. Um, I might have students, for example, this quarter, I had them think about how they would use AI as engineers in their field, what would be some typical use cases, and each of them presented two or three use cases. The main issue to come out of that, I guess, was that students thought it gave them some good starting points, it gave them perspectives maybe that they hadn't considered before, but they were all aware that they needed to triangulate, that they needed to check the data, nothing that they took from uh, chat gpt in this case could they could be considered fact they needed to go and check it somewhere else next slide please and this goes to the next slide on reducing imposed risks and harms as jackie mentioned earlier a big issue is bias in the data bias in the training sets and my students are of course aware of that as well another issue maybe we've talked about is the digital divide some students, we're all using, well, I guess speaking for myself, I'm still using free version. Uh, I know some students are paying for versions and I'm thinking that that could be an issue in the future. Who pays for these different technologies? Maybe it's $20 for one, maybe it's $20 for another AI that focuses on graphics, depending on how many subjects they have, that could add up. So I see that potential. Also um, having access to software that you would need, having access to um, experts knowing how, knowing different aspects of this software. So in terms of reducing imposed risks and harms, I think it's important that not only we have specialist engineers, prompt engineers, but all students should learn a little bit about digital literacy or AI literacy, if we're gonna call it that. And so how can they develop good prompts? What is most likely to give them good information? How can they fine tune their questions? But at the end of the day, how can they also get um, verification? And let's see, I guess you can, um, most of the issues that are on that slide we've talked about already, maybe reducing the risk of offensive, harmful content. And I don't know if some of you have seen, there were newspaper reports showing how people in Africa, Kenya, I believe it was, uh, were being paid a pittance to check this kind of information. So that goes both to ethical considerations, who is benefiting from these technologies. And next slide, please. Yeah, so where I see um, the most interesting aspect of this technology is um, enhancing human capabilities. And this might involve getting more information more easily, more quickly, more efficiently about social justice, about whatever their concerns are. So example, in the engineering class, some of the students are dealing with huge topics that can't be settled in class, global, war global warming, to name one, different aspects of that. Um, we can, of course, access more information through AI that will give us different perspectives, but it can free up time that might otherwise have been spent gathering individual pieces of information. And another aspect I see with AI is, um, I think I've put it down here on helping users to become more productive and personalized learning. So we all know that students have different needs, different ways of learning. Some of them have um, special needs, maybe, they have issues with sight or with hearing and so on. And I can see lots of potential for assistive technologies for students as well um, using AI that maybe they could come up with different ways of using that technology to help them study, to help them process information in class, and of course, to help them write papers, write research papers, which is mainly what I'm concerned about. But also I think that in their free time, life isn't all school. Maybe um, it'll encourage more avenues for creative expression. So on that um, optimistic note, and I see, I wanna make sure that I give enough time for our librarian, uh, Andrew, who has used AI with my students to very good effect. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew. Thanks. All right, 
So hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Carlos, uh, as Teresa has just mentioned. I'm one of the librarians at Santa Clara University and specifically I work with the uh, School of Engineering. So for my portion of the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about social justice and information literacy, and also how we could use chat GPT for information literacy instruction. So if you could go to the next slide. Great. Um, so there is a history of social justice and librarianship. Um, but traditionally librarians or libraries were historically not welcoming of marginalized communities. So there's the history of segregated libraries. You might've heard of the Tougaloo Nine who actually led a read-in at a public library in Mississippi. And I think they were one of the first groups doing such, doing that type of um, protest. And then there's also just generally a low number of BIPOC folks in librarianship. I think the current percentage is about 85% of library workers are white with a slight downward trend. I think they said in about 10 years, it'll be down to 83%. Uh, next slide. So the American Library Association has tried to really address social justice and human rights throughout its time. Uh, in 1962, they adopted a statement that said, all state associations had to be open to everyone, regardless of race, religion, and personal beliefs. And this was a direct reaction to the Tougaloo Nine read-in. Um, unfortunately, four states actually withdrew their membership from ALA. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, in 1969, they started the Social Responsibilities Roundtable um, to try to make the organization and profession more progressive. And they also sponsor Spectrum scholarships to help recruit and train underrepresented and minoritized students. Uh, and locally, the SCU library is, we're working to define what a social justice library is and what it can do, really to help inform our work moving forward with our strategic plan and to also lead the profession forward. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna do a little bit of an overview about critical librarianship. Um, these two quotes really spoke to me. Uh, so students must understand that the library's grammar of information are reflections of a particular worldview, Anglo, Western, Christian, and predominantly male. And one of the insights of critical librarianship since the 70s has been this acknowledgement that invisible and intellectual structures actually have a relationship to the material world of knowledge construction. And I think these two quotes really speak to the debate that I think comes up every once in a while among instruction librarians. And is that, are we meant to just teach skills that already exist to help students exist in a dominant culture? Or should they also see themselves as guides to discovering more democratic models that are representative of the actual world for our students? So next slide. There isn't like a single organization that's really defined what critical librarianship is, but the following are kind of some general ideas that are accepted to help define critical librarianship. So the first most important one is really that libraries are not neutral. You might have heard in the past couple of years, there have been a lot of discussions about how libraries should remain neutral and they should allow everyone to use their spaces, even organizations whose main goal is the eradication of an entire subgroup. Um, so that, that discussion has, has been kind of going on a lot. And, and realistically, we have to realize that libraries are not neutral. We may be nonpartisan, but we still have like a political stance to ourselves. Uh, we should hold our organizations accountable and interrogate its practices, structures, and systems. And we have to work to be anti-racist and address the ways that libraries replicate systemic harms. So next slide. So social justice shows up in information literacy a number of ways. I think the first way is really representation in the research process. So really bringing in the discussion about own voices in research. Um, I think Mara and Dominique will be talking a little bit about that in terms of research justice in a later presentation, but we could also think about it as topic development and helping students find out like, oh, this person or this community isn't actually represented in the literature, what can we do to bring their voices in? And then access to information or open access is also another social justice issue. And that kind of comes in with discussions around gray literature or patent searching, just finding ways for students to access information that they might not have access to if they weren't part of a large, um, large university. And then I think as 
was pointed out earlier by Teresa, there is kind of a demand now for multiple literacies. So um, I think this quote is really important. In times defined by rapid change, much is at stake for education and how literacy is defined, taught, and measured. So I think we could all agree we live in an information society where the skill of finding and using information is, is increasingly important. So libraries have actually started focusing on multiple literacies. We're working on a data literacy program right now at Santa Clara University. We're really heavily involved in uh, supporting our information literacy outcomes at Santa Clara. At Santa Clara and we're, we're constantly looking for other ways that we could support uh, learning for our students. And libraries have actually started using chat GPT itself as an information literacy tool. Um, public librarians use it for reader's advisory to help to help um, their community find additional books. Um, and academic librarians have used it as an opportunity to talk about citations and searching for information. So next slide, please. So when ChatGPT really came out, I thought to myself, what are some ways that we could use ChatGPT to help students surface related project or uh, related ideas for their topics? Um, there's just a lot of information in ChatGPT that I think um, students could really tap into to help really inform their idea or their, their understanding of a topic. So next slide. So on screen right now is an example of a concept map. Um, this is the one that I've used with Teresa's class before. Uh, so in the center, there's the plant-based diet and then branching off our different um, related topics. Um, I found that working with students to create concept maps really kind of helped them visualize what they already know. It could also be used as a tool to explain what they already know to their research partners. Um, at SCU, I started first by actually having students create these concept maps on paper. Um, and then I transitioned to Google Slides once I realized I think working with paper was a bit more difficult for students. So Google Slides allows me to actually like show them the drawing tools and also track um, their progress. So next slide. All right, let me take a sip of water. <clears throat> with the release of ChatGPT, I started wondering if I could create mind maps using it. I've always, like I said, I've always loved mind maps. And I kept running into the issue that ChatGPT only exports text, so we can't actually draw anything. But I eventually found out that you could actually tell it to, to output code in specific languages. So you could have it output, uh, output Python scripts, output HTML for a website, things like that. Um, so I actually found out that there is a language called Plant UML that's, that you could use to create content maps. So the way the uh, activity goes is I ask students to log in to chat GPT if they feel comfortable and if not I could log in for them or they could use um, their classmate login and I have them include the following prompt into chat GPT using plant UML create a concept map with topic in the center highlighting related ideas and examples and the most important part is the using plant UML bit of the prompt because this, this prompts ChatGPT to actually output code that can be used somewhere else. Once it's created their uh, code, students then go to plantuml.com and then they paste their code and the concept map comes to life. So you can see on the right-hand screen, I actually created a concept map around affordable housing and solar power. This is all generated by ChatGPT. And if you use um, the prompts and actually input it into plantuml.com, it outputs like a really beautiful mind map. Like I could never draw something like that. My drawings are really bad. Uh, next slide, please. So previously I actually had students compare their handmade concept maps to the ones made by chat GPT. Um, but I found that it didn't actually get the outcome that I was hoping for. I was hoping that students would be able to identify the differences or similarities between their maps and the ones generated by ChatGPT. So now, rather than having them make two maps, I have them focus on the ChatGPT one, and I ask them to look for what appears to be missing or what is really interesting based on their own knowledge of the topic. And I also ask them to review the map for incorrect things or other avenues they could take their research on. So I think it's really important to also really highlight the incorrect things that ChatGPT is generating 
Um, because as we know, it creates hallucinations or, or false information. So it's, it's good to have students start to critique the types of things that come out of chat GPT. And so far in every session that I've led using chat GPT, the question of citation has come up, uh, which is always like a perfect opportunity to have that discussion about the ethics of information use. So next slide, please. So a few ways that social justice and chat GPT kind of go together, come thinking about it from like a library information science perspective is uh, as Teresa mentioned, there are versions of chat GPT that require a subscription. So that's bound to create the haves and the haves not and like the digital divide. And the corpus that chat GPT was actually trained on is predominantly English language. So should you ask it to try to generate something in a different language, it wouldn't be able to do that or it would provide you like the incorrect translation. So those are, I think, some issues in terms of social justice and chat GPT. And with that, quick little overview about librarianship and chat GPT and social justice. So I'm gonna turn it back to Heather for our Q&A. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. Round of applause for our presenters. You can use the uh, response function or feel free to clap into your microphone. Uh, we have about 18 minutes left, so plenty of time for discussion. So what would work best is if you'd like to ask a question, use the raised hand function, and that way I can see who's in the queue. Or if you're not able to speak and want to put your question into the chat, you can do it that way. I'd like to start us off with a question, if I may. That was... I just enjoyed so much of what you all said. I'm gonna take us back to the beginning, which this is a question that might seem like it's it stands aside a little bit from the main part of your discussion, but I do wanna hear more about it. And I'm gonna be selfish and take the mic, which is you talked about doing some overviews of gray literature, um, like a seminar on it or a talks on it. And I think this, for me, gray literature is some of the most fascinating literature out there that students often don't think about in terms of research. I'd love to hear just a little bit more about what you did and are those resources available somewhere so that other institutions can use them. Um, I'd be curious to hear just a little bit more if somebody can speak to that. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Thank you. Um, we actually didn't create any like modules that are living online. They're all kind of just okay. notes and slides that I do. But we, we found that really talking about gray literature is important because it, it also highlights to students that folks don't always have information to the access to the information that they need. Right. So I think that's where, where gray literature really comes into play because you have um, like archive or bio archive or even things just like white papers from different corporations and just really highlighting like, yes, we have access to all these databases and we get a lot of money for it. So take advantage of it. But once you leave, once you don't have access to that, you have to find ways to then access that that needed information to be the work that you, that you want to do. But I, I am working on creating a module that exists online for gray literature. I just haven't had the chance to do it yet. Well, it would be fantastic to hear more once you do. That's cool. Thank you. I've been relying on Cornell's resources until I can get something at UCSC. So mm -hmm. other I questions? Think to oh, to yeah, add right. on to that a little bit, like one of the th reasons that it became so important to talk about in our engineering communications class is because of their constant, like, when they're doing their research topics, they want the most recent stuff. So they're pulling from archive and all the other various like kind of preprint sites a lot. And so it was really vital to have that conversation. Um, and it was really helpful that we could kind of talk about it and we can always kind of talk about it with the pandemic in mind too. And sort of some of the pitfalls that were public um, through using preprint sites and, and all that. So um, it became sort of like, we, we really kind of put that number one on Andrew's task list of like, help us with great literature uh, when, when that was going. That's a good so point. I just put in the chat um, a uh, guide to gray literature from um, Princeton. This is just a Thank basic um, set, of, set of resources that to get started. That's great. Other questions that people have for any of the speakers? I guess there's several questions for Andrew about um, the concept mapping exercise, the why you decided, uh, why you didn't get as much out of students comparing and contrasting their concept maps with the one that they did online. Yeah, so what I noticed was that 
I think students felt overwhelmed at the chat GPT ones because there was so much stuff there that they didn't actually know or they didn't think about. So I think I think they just kind of like froze when they were doing those comparisons. Because like when you ask students to create a concept map based on their own knowledge, they'll, they'll only put so much there. I think on average, there were probably like eight entries on the students homemade or handmade concept maps, but the chat GPT one probably had like 20 or more. So I think doing that comparison felt like overwhelming for students and it didn't really kind of like surface the things that I wanted them to, to really figure out, which was their knowledge is different from chat GPT and that there are things that chat GPT may know that they might not know that they want to incorporate into their own work. So it, it, I think it made more sense to just focus on the chat GPT generated one because they know what they don't know. So I see in the in the chat, there's two uh, questions that kind of sort of relate to that compare and contrast activity, which really seems to have piqued a lot of people's interest. <laughs> so and I I can't wait. I I didn't know if other people were like me. I had to like restrain myself from opening up a new window and trying. What what was it called? Um, I wrote it down here. The plant. UML. UML. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, okay, I have to try this right away, but I'm waiting till lunch. Um, so uh, Kim and then Judy, did, did um, Andrew's recent comments kind of get at some of the issues you were curious about, or if not, do you have follow-up questions? I see there's, there's some action in the chat. This is the, most, yes, Kim says, okay, great. Let us know. In the meantime, are there other questions or comments, things that people want to add uh, to the discussion, or things they want to know? I have a question for the panel. Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot. Yesterday, we heard a little bit about ChatGPT. In my own um, writing program, we've had some discussions about it, uh, kind of taking the temperature where people fall. I guess what I would say is kind of from your sense of working with students, where do you all fall on the continuum of like, yay, ChatGPT, or like, oh, or like, how would you characterize your response and maybe why briefly? Just weigh in for us, if you don't mind. I guess um, I could start. I'm definitely on the yay chat GPT because chat GPT is here. Um, AI is in our lives. It's been in our lives. It's going to be more pervasive in our lives. Um, so there's no point sticking your head in a bucket of sand or pretending it's going to go away. It's not. And as an educator, I want to use it productively. I want to use it in a way that helps students. So yeah, I need to play with it. I want to become a prompt engineer myself. Oh, nice. <laughs> I find it interesting that I think the students are a little bit more worried about it than I am. Um, uh, I had in my first year writing class, um, a couple, multiple students actually worked on um, AI and concerns they had with AI. One student ran a study where I don't know how they're in touch with all their old high school teachers, but they sent a, a sample of uh, work they did in high school on a chat GPT generated essay on the same topic and had the teachers try and figure out which is the actual student one and the actual chat GPT one. And he had like a good result of like, I think like 60% of the teachers figured out which one was correct. But then he added a note, but, but imagine if you have a hundred essays to read and you're not thinking about this question and you're really tired and want to get through it, you're going to miss stuff. Um, and so he kind of brought, so, I mean, he was kind of raising these concerns that, you know, like, I don't know, maybe I'm just like dated now. I'm just kind of past the concern of like, well, whatever, I don't have time to deal with your plagiarism, but, um, uh, <laughs> but they're sort of thinking about those things. And I had, I think five or six of my engineering writing students do their topic on ethics related to AI. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really concerned about it. Um, uh, so it's, it's kind of, you know, I like to kind of meet that energy at least, um, and see where that's going. That's great. Andrew or other folks? I had students, uh, do an activity early on, um, that I think for, really helped them to kind of clarify, um, the limitations and advantages of ChatGPT once they were thinking about their research topic. Um, they were to ask ChatGPT to summarize current research and developments in that field, first for a non-technical audience and then for a technical audience. And one of the things that they found is that these summaries did help them to identify subtopics that they hadn't anticipated related to their topic. As an example, 
example, um, I have them do computational creativity. And, you know, we look at some of the subtopics and talk about how that can really help to narrow down ideas. Um, but once students um, kind of look through what they find is that the discussion that they get from chat GPT is very surface level and that they mm -hmm. Um, can't really find um, the level of technical detail that they know that they need. And when they know that they need to satisfy the needs of technical audiences in their report writing, they are usually able to come to the conclusion that ChatGPT is not going to help them pass the class. Um, and I think, you know, getting them to kind of reach that conclusion and to address those limitations, you know, has helped me to, I think, successfully, um, you know, get them to assess the usefulness of it in the class. That's great. I think one thing, one thing I want to add, too, is that we were in a recent Bannon integration grant meeting, and one of our colleagues had mentioned that her partner said, we need to start training students to deal with AI in general because it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. It's going to be their work life moving forward. So I think, I think making sure that they at least understand what goes behind it and what the outputs are are really important because that is going to be their future. That's a good point. I, I like that. That's that's a useful talking point, too, I think, for some writing programs who might need to speak to this to other faculty. Uh, we've got two hands up, uh, Nicole and then Dan. Hi, thanks for the wonderful panel presentation. Um, and full disclosure, I'm also at Santa Clara University. So, <laughs> but I'm curious, this is less about chat G GPT, um, but I feel like the model that you've used in this course, highlighting um, social justice and um, and tech and you know AI within that is such a great model that could be replicated in other departments. So I'm curious if you've um, had any um, any conversations or any uh, interest from other departments in in replicating this. We'd love to be in conversation with other departments because I think one of the great things about this grant is it's an interdisciplinary um, collaboration and it has helped us to get out of um, some of the kind of, you know, siloing of our mm -hmm. individual uh, departments. Um, and so I think that we're, we're definitely interested in, in, in expanding on, on that collaboration. So we'd love to partner with others. And I think one of the things that's also come out in some of our discussions, especially with people in School of Engineering, is that their what we're doing in the English department um, is not quite where they are in the School of Engineering. And so we find kind of we're pulling on them a little bit um, and that hopefully will kind of create more of a ripple effect as well throughout the School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. Um, we're getting a little pushback too, but like it's still, um, uh, you know, I think that there's there's ways that this is already sort of having um, some connections across the university too. All right, Dan? Dory. Or Dory, Dory, yes. This is, panel. This is really, really interesting. So um, I've noticed like people who work on this topic, I think eventually kind of develop some sort of um, mental model or metaphor for chat GPT. And that's something that I'm really interested in right now. So for example, um, you might think about ChatGPT as being your smart roommate, right? So you can talk to your roommate about your assignment. They they give you some ideas or your TA or your graduate research assistant. So I was just wondering if that's true for you all. Have you thought of, um, when you think about ChatGPT, what kind of category in your mind does it occupy? Like what kind of metaphor do you use to think about how people interact with it? Uh, I think this is a really interesting question, especially in light of what Judy had mentioned in chat about being curious how students view chat chatbots as their intellectual superior. I I personally have always viewed AI as like an assistant or someone that will help kind of augment my own abilities rather than someone who is like a superior to me. But I mean, I think it'll all depend once we hit that singularity and AI is actually better than us. But for the time being, I'm going to assume that it's just going to be my partner on the side. One of the things that um, we also do in this class, or at least several of us do, is we have uh, the students do a group presentation on 
a movie or a TV show that kind of raises some of these ethical issues about technology. And a lot of the popular movies are like Skynet, they, they robots are gonna kill us all sort of AI related kind of things, right? Um, and so in part of that process, uh, they have to come up with sort of like, okay, well, what's happening in the real world that we need to think about that the movie is sort of kind of alarming us to. And so, yeah, Black Mirror is some of the options for sure. Um, uh, and so one of the things that they sort of notice in the process of doing this is that like, oh yeah, we need to be kind of think about these questions that are being raised by the movie. So we don't get to the point where, you know, we're having to get Arnold Schwarzenegger um, to come and take everybody down kind of thing. So, um, uh, so yeah, so, and, and I have, I always have groups that do Blade Runner in particular. Um, and so this, and this isn't, and I like Blade Runner still really works. They love it. Um, uh, so even though it's like almost as old as me, but it's, um, uh, but that's kind of like a, a really frequent discussion. And so it's in their minds that like, they want to kind of keep it, I think, as an assistant. Um, and not let Skynet take over basically or the matrix or whatever. But I think that, you know, we talk about those things as part of the, over the course as well. Does anybody else from the panel want to speak to the, the descriptions? All right. Okay, we have maybe time for one more question if there is one. And if not, I'll turn the table over to Dan again. He's going to segue us. I had more of a comment, just that I really appreciate sort of this um, overlay of the ethical considerations and information literacy in general, right? That these spaces are constructed non-inclusively. And then chat GPT is trained non-inclusively, right? So we have these very similar um, yeah, the, this, the very similar uh, critique, you know, that you've got to go in with the appropriate context and critical thinking in order to use information literacy tools, right, in order to navigate these spaces at all critically. And so I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I am certainly curious how I can get students to, uh, I, I mean, they're interested in that space, obviously, and, and you all are, are displaying really good examples of students exploring it. Um, but the materials, right, to help them, uh, to help introduce them to that, uh, right? I work a lot with first quarter students, and I want them to come into an uh, institution of higher education and climb up that ladder very quickly uh, so that they understand where they're at, right? And that I want to give them that, uh, the, the situation and the current <laughs> situationality of information literacy so that they can engage with that in an activist way that changes our institutions. Um, I don't want them to wait until like they've got that four-year degree and then they're kind of already acculturated. <laughs> into the institutions as they currently are. So that's not really a question, but I really appreciate how many resources you have and especially those student generated rubrics for thinking through some of these issues. Um, so those are very useful. So I just wanted to point that out, but that's very rich, rich ground. And I think very useful for, um, yeah, for, for young people right now in this moment. Thank you, Joy, and thank you to our panel. So a round of applause, we are out of time. Uh, it was a great way to start our day and you gave us a perfect connection from sort of where we ended up yesterday and kind of where we're gonna be thinking today. So excellent, excellent work. Um, all right, Dan, over to you.